in the United States of America, some of the world's most dangerous and notorious criminals are locked behind bars. Brian Nichols is not only a murderer who murdered innocent victims in a court of law, he definitely was somebody who engaged in all kinds of different crimes. While on trial for rape, Brian Nichols went on a rampage. He hit her so hard that her head went against the cinder block wall, knocked her out. I forced my way into the courtroom, and I saw Judge Barnes laying with blood coming out the back of his head. A prisoner who was armed and dangerous was free and on the run. He forces his way into a Gwinnett woman's apartment. I was concerned because he was now out. I then called my wife and told her to get our daughter out of school. He's just willing to mow over anyone who gets in his way. So he's absolutely still dangerous uh, no matter where he is. Brian Nichols suddenly claimed the top spot in America's Most Wanted. Brian Nichols assaults a deputy, steals her gun, then hunts down and murders Judge Roland Barnes and his court reporter. Outside, Deputy Hoyt Teasley is shot and killed by Nichols on the sidewalk. Even when he was securely locked behind bars, Brian Nichols posed a serious threat to everyone he met. They move him from place to place. They do not let the same guards guard him for a prolonged period of time because they don't want them to get too comfortable with him. And if he gets out, there's no telling what he might do. Georgia Diagnostic and Classification Prison is a maximum security facility, home to around 2,500 inmates. A maximum security prison, it's more restrictive. They have gun posts, there's more fences. The thing that makes maximum security prisons more dangerous is that the inmates in there usually, usually have a longer sentence. So they've already made it up their minds that they're going to live and die in prison. That's their home. So when it does kick off, they go all the way. They, they'll attempt to kill you. One of the most feared inmates kept behind bars here is mass murderer Brian Nichols. I think he's the kind of person that's always thinking, always analyzing, always looking for the crack in the wall, always looking for the light you know, through the door. I think Brian could be a potential escape risk. I think if Nichols felt cornered, I think he would he'd very possibly kill again. He was a natural born killer. In stark contrast to many of the world's most dangerous prisoners, 33-year-old Brian Nichols had enjoyed a good life. He was educated. He was employed at a pretty good job. And apparently, he was pretty good at it. And he was, he, basically, he was living a successful life. But everything changed when he was accused of rape and aggravated abuse by a former girlfriend. He was facing very significant jail time if he got convicted of any number of the counts that were lodged against him. Nichols' behavior in court made everyone nervous. Before I left the house, I remember the last thing I said to my wife was, I don't feel safe in that courtroom. Their fears were confirmed when Nichols suddenly turned violent. And one of the deputies went into the lockup with her, with her gun. At that point in time, he hit her, hit her so hard that her head went against the cinder block wall, knocked her out. Now, on the loose in the courthouse, Nichols went on a killing spree. Judge Barden wouldn't have seen him come into the main room. Brian shot Judge Barden in the left side of the head. He then took his rampage out onto the streets. And there was a house with the door open, and there was a federal agent in there working on his bathrooms. He ended up killing the man. And shortly after that is when he kidnapped the girl. 
something happened that made him go from kind of a regular person to somebody who would kill four people. Nichols grew up in a middle-class family during the 1970s and 80s in Baltimore, Maryland. He was a good student and a talented sportsman. He had a very involved family, and they were intact. They were together. So he had people who, who, who liked him. Um, he had a, a, a body of friends. At the age of 21, Nichols was kicked off the college football team for stealing and moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Seeming to make a new start, Nichols secured a steady job at a multinational technology company, and he had got himself a girlfriend. She was a, a very successful woman. Uh, the times I spoke with her, I found her to be very intelligent, um, very articulate, um, very well put together. You know, intellectually, she, she had a lot going for her, and, and, and that was a good compliment because Brian was also very intelligent. In 2004, when Brian Nichols was 32 years old, his life took a sudden downward spiral when he was accused of rape. I am Barry Hazen. I'm an attorney, criminal defense attorney, and I represented Brian Nichols in 2004 and 5, where he was charged with rape in Atlanta, Georgia. The woman who lodged the complaint against Brian is a woman who he had, who had been in a relationship with him for a number of years. They didn't live together, but they were very much a couple in, in a lot of ways. I know they were talking about getting married. The relationship was not without its difficulties, and Brian was not faithful. He did have another relationship during that period of time. Um, and there was another woman, and she became pregnant through Brian and that created a, a lot of turmoil in Brian's relationship. Brian's girlfriend eventually left him, but Brian was not ready to let her go. What's interesting about rape is that people think of rape as a sex crime, and while yes, it has a horrific sexual component, the real driving factor behind rape is control. And so it sounds like in this case, his girlfriend had left him, which caused a void, which caused anger, which caused resentment. So as a result of that anger, he decided to duct tape her and rape her and sodomize her in order to exert control over a situation that he no longer had control over. The first time I met and, and saw Brian was at the Fulton County Jail. He was being held without bond. The conditions at the Fulton County Jail were not very good conditions at all. Of the jails I go to, I think it's probably the, was the least desirable place to be. Inmates that end up in county jail can be anywhere from getting a DUI, driving under the influence, murder, rape, molestation, robbery, armed robbery. We spent uh, probably an hour, hour and a half talking back and forth about the facts of the case. With clients, sometimes you build a relationship right away Sometimes it takes a while, but with Brian, there, there was a bond. Barry Hazen knew Nichols faced significant jail time as he had been charged with a number of offenses. I think there are about six or seven counts altogether, but of course the biggest one was rape, which could get you a life sentence in Georgia. And the aggravated assault was very serious. That can get you up to 20 years in Georgia. Uh, the others were less, but they were serious. So he was facing very significant jail time if he got convicted of any number of the counts that were lodged against him. I knew it was gonna be a challenging case because any time that you have a, a sex-related case, uh, a rape case, um, you, you're, you're walking uphill with a rock. But I liked Brian. I found Brian to be very intelligent, very articulate, very warm with me, very respectful of me. And I believed that there were sufficient facts to work with to be able to defend Brian. But there was one issue about Nichols that niggled Barry. I thought that Brian was very 
taken with himself, I think that Brian had perhaps certain narcissistic tendencies. I didn't think he was mentally ill, but I thought that there were certain issues that I needed to take note of. On February 21st, 2005, the trial started at Fulton County Courthouse. Despite building a strong rapport with his client, Barry quickly noticed there were red flags in Nichols' behavior. The first day of trial, um, um, I, I think the judge was being tested by Brian. Brian immediately said he had to go to the bathroom, I remember. And it must have been in there for 20 minutes. And the judge was asking, where is he, where is he, where is he? What's, what's going on here? And he ordered me to go in there to get him. And Brian was just standing there. And so I, I don't know what was going on other than the fact that we already had a judge that was irritated. Superior Court Judge Roland Barnes was presiding over the hearing. He was understanding and he cared about people. He couldn't care if you were rich or poor. He cared about you. Almost everybody wanted to go to, in front of Judge Barnes because they know they will be treated fair. The trial continued for five days, and throughout, Barry was concerned about what Nichols would try next. I didn't feel threatened by him at all, but I, I felt that he was being kind of a pouty kid in a way, being resistive to the authority of the court over him. Despite Nichols' provocative behavior, Barry was doing his best to secure a positive outcome for his client. It went really well for him. I mean, um, the, the vote was 8-4 not guilty. And then there was a discussion with the judge and, and the district attorney and myself. It was a hung jury. The prosecutors wanted a retrial, but Judge Barnes was not keen. The judge did not want to retry the case. He wanted them to let it go. It was a fateful decision for him throwing up his hands and said, OK, then we'll retry it on Monday. The prospect of sitting alongside Brian Nichols again for the retrial made Barry nervous. I thought the danger was a possibility. Something was up. I, w I wasn't sure what it was. I, I didn't know if they had anything planned, but I thought the mind was spinning at that point in time. I, I thought we could have a problem. Early morning on March 7, 2005, the retrial of 33-year-old Brian Nichols for the offenses including the rape and battery of his former girlfriend began. My name is Grant Lee White. Um, I was a sergeant with the Fulton County Sheriff Department and a bailiff for Judge Roland Barnes on the Brian Nichols case. At the courthouse, you are controlling the courtroom. You are bringing inmates in front of the judge. Brian Nichols is very quiet. Always carrying a, carrying a Bible. He didn't give any problems. He complied with whatever he, he told him. Nichols appeared to behave himself. That was until day four when Judge Barnes made a shocking discovery. And the judge called us into chambers, and he was very angry, and we, which is unusual for Judge Barnes. He was such an easygoing man that he had a, a manila folder, and he tossed the folder across the desk, almost at me, like, in anger. And the picture slid out of the folder. There were two photographs. And he said, here, this is what we found in your client's shoes yesterday. They looked like hinges without the spindles because they had holes in them. And you could see they had been sharpened, they'd been scraped. We found out later that it was the frame from the light fixture in his cell that he had taken apart. And he had two of those planks, one in each shoe. That's when I thought, well, wait a minute. We, we're going beyond being resistance here. Something's not right. There was a threat. He had crossed the line with me. While Barry could never have imagined what his client would do next, the judge was evidently nervous. The tension level on that Thursday was high. The judge it, it was, seemed concerned. The judge said, we, we need to get things off the tables that he can use. 
For instance, you know, they, they have these little plastic discs that you run wires through. The judge ordered those removed from the table. He ordered the, the water pitchers removed from the table so they couldn't be used as a weapon. And the judge actually said, we need more beef in the courtroom. That's the way he put it. I remember looking back to see if there was going to be more beef, and they, they had the same middle-aged woman deputy about 30 feet behind him, and she wasn't going to be any help. And so I became concerned, and then the judge, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, you need to stay alert because you're sitting right next to him. On the final day of the retrial, Nichols was, as usual, being held in Fulton County Jail until proceedings began. In the courthouse, Grantley White was the bailiff assigned to Judge Barnes that day. I always, every morning before the court starts, pray for the protection to God to protect me. This is the first time I have given an interview about what happened, it's hard to talk about it. On March 11th, 2005, the last day for the trial of Byron Nichols, I asked the judge if I can go, if I can get breakfast. And he said, yes. He was just talking to attorneys about their fee. And he felt safe that nothing would happen. And Nichols was driven from Rice Street, the Fulton County Jail, by van each morning to the uh, courthouse. And there's a, uh, a, a, a sally port kind of on the back of the courthouse where they, they bring prisoners in. They don't come in through the main entrance. And they're, they're brought up in an elevator, you know, a, a secured elevator, to whatever floor the courtroom is on. And then he'd be escorted into, into that. Uh, before I left the house, I remember the last thing I said to my wife was, I don't feel safe in that courtroom. Up until the day before, I had no problem with him. Um, I, I, I knew he was being a problem for other people, but I didn't really think he was a physical threat. But suddenly, I did. At 8.45 a.m., Nichols had been transferred from Fulton County Jail to a holding cell located in the new building of Fulton County Courthouse. There's always risks involved. When an inmate comes to court on a jury trial, he's brought upstairs to change into civilian clothes. You open the door and then you remove the handcuffs from the inmate and place him in the holding cell, which is very risky because most problems happen when you remove removing the handcuffs from inmates. Nichols was being escorted into the court by a female deputy. He took pride in being a ladies' man and being able to charm people. The deputy, she liked him. She actually told me, this guy's innocent. So she 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 felt that, you know, she she was forming a kinship with him. The deputy had built a trust with Nichols and had let down her guard. And one of the deputies went into the lockup um, with, with her gun. At that point in time, he hit her, hit her so hard that her head went against the cinder block wall, knocked her out. He took her key. And now he also can put on civilian clothes, and he's got a gun. And then calmly walked across that bridge from the new building in, into the old building where Judge Barnes is. As I turn the corner to go down the hallway, I saw a person with a gun in their hand. Then I recognized it was Brian Nichols. He didn't shoot me right away, so I figured he didn't want to kill me. So I decided to see if I can talk to him. And I asked him what he was doing. And he kept saying, don't do anything. Don't do anything, Cyrus, don't do anything. And I tried to tell him, well, there's no reason for him to do it. He said, it's too late for that. 
Rather than make his escape, it appeared that Nichols had a plan and was intent on vengeance and took Grantley hostage. And he put the gun to the back of my head and he took my gun. He walked me into the judge's office and when I walked through the door, I saw there were some of the folks that worked for the judge. And Brian Nichols said to me, handcuff these folks. I didn't want to do it. One of the ladies said, please, Grantley, please do what he said. Then he said, handcuff yourself. Brian Nichols threw the handcuffs at me. And I look at it, and I saw blood on them. I knew it belongs to my deputy, because her name was engraved on them. The thought ran through my mind that he had killed her. I handcuffed myself, and I tried to make them loose so maybe I can get out of them, because I knew that under the judge's desk was a duress button. As I stand over by the desk, I thought to myself, how am I going to do this? So I decided to fake a heart attack and fell down to, on my knees. And as I fell down on my knees, I pushed the button underneath the judge's desk. Central Control responded to the alarm call, but Nichols was ready and reported all was well. But operators sensed something was very wrong. One of the, the sergeants in the central control knew my voice and said, that's not White. That's not Sergeant White's voice. Then I heard one of the ladies say, Sergeant, he's gone, he's gone. While Grantley grabbed his radio to tell central control what had just happened, Nichols was tracking down his first kill. He then calmly walked into Judge Barnes's chambers. Remember, Judge Barnes is on the bench on the divorce case. He walks into chambers, unlocked door, and then goes from chambers into the courtroom. Judge Barton wouldn't have seen him come into the main room and just immediately Brian turned to his right, shot Judge Barton on the left side of the head. When Julie Brando, the court reporter, turned around, he shot her. And then left the courtroom through the main door Grantley had heard the gunshots and ran to the courtroom. I forced my way into the courtroom, and I saw Judge Barnes laying by his desk with blood coming out the back of his head. And I saw Julie. That's when the whole bunch of deputies grabbed me and pulled me out of the courtroom. Nichols was making his bolt for freedom. He then went uh, down the stairs, and one of the deputies went running after him. Having shot the judge and the court reporter, Brian Nichols began his escape from the county courthouse. Nichols targeted the judge because he really believed the judge was probably responsible for his fate. While the judge may have been responsible for having finding him guilty or not guilty and imposing sentence, what Nichols is unable to process in his mind is that it's not ultimately the judge's fault. It's his fault. He's the one that chose to engage in the rape. He's the one that chose to engage in the violence. He's the one that got himself arrested. But he's unable to take accountability for his actions. Nichols was trying to escape the courthouse, but was being chased down. He got down to the bottom floor, and when the deputy came running after him through the door, shot the deputy also, Deputy Teasley. I thought in my mind that, uh... Maybe a deputy had shot Brian Nichols, but he had shot one of, the, one of the deputies that proceeded down the stairs behind him. It was horrible. It was a horrible day. As 43-year-old father of two, Hoyt Teasley, lay dying, Nichols went on the run. It really shows not only the level of savagery and sadism that Nichols was willing to go to in order to gain his freedom in a way that was clearly never going to work long term, but also his lack of accountability. What makes Nichols such a dangerous prisoner is that he's willing to go to really great lengths to get his needs met. 
that's just the way Nichols thinks. There's no other way for him to escape threat other than violence. Unaware of his client's killing spree, defense attorney Barry Hazen was making his way to the courthouse to get ready for the 915 start. As I was walking to the courthouse, I heard sirens. Maybe four or five seconds after I heard them, these cars were whizzing past me, police cars whizzing past me to the courthouse. Um, and then I saw deputies pouring out of the courthouse from different, different exits, guns drawn. And I, I knew, I just knew that it had to involve Brian. One of the deputies who I know came running up the street and shoved me into a storefront and said, you're in danger. Your client has just shot Judge Barnes. I was concerned because he was now out. I then called my wife and told her to get our daughter out of school and do not go home. If he was looking for revenge, I don't know how he felt about me, but it was a pretty tense, tense time. I mean, we didn't know where he was or what he might do. Intent on evading justice, Nichols turned his attention to getting out of Atlanta. In 2005, I was working at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I was a featured reporter, and it was a good job. I parked in the usual spot I always park, and I usually got there around 9.30 or so. I didn't have the radio on, so I didn't hear any news of what was going on. It just seemed like another ordinary day. So I locked my car and was about to leave when the SUV pulled in beside me. Nice looking black man with no shirt said, do you know how to get to Lenox Square, which is a local shopping mall? Being polite, I started giving him direction. He got out of the car and walked around. I didn't think anything about it until he pulled the gun. Don was the fourth person Nichols had confronted since escaping. He was completely unaware the man holding the gun was a multiple murderer. When he said, give me your keys, I said to myself, this is a carjacking. Just, just stay calm, give him the keys, and he'll drive off, and that's it. But then when he took my keys and unlocked the trunk and told me to get in, I knew this was serious business. He was giving orders like a drill instructor. He was not erratic. He was amazingly calm. He was just upset that I wouldn't follow his directions. We kind of stared at each other for a few minutes, and he said, get in the trunk, I'll kill you. I shook my head, and he kept, kept closer and flared at me, and he said, get in the trunk, or I'll shoot you. And after I refused to get into the trunk, he ended up hitting me over my eye, and I fell. And then I scrambled to my feet and ran out this way. This was the most terrifying thing that ever happened. I'd never had a gun pointed at me. I'd never been threatened. But I think I was reasonably calm considering the situation. And I went two blocks up that way, and ran into a fellow reporter, and he told me there had been a shooting at the courthouse, the judge had been killed, two other people shot, and he said, sounds like the same guy. And he said, there were police put down a block interviewing people, and so I went there, told him what had happened, described my green Honda that he had taken, and then I went to the medical center to get my wrist fixed and my eyes stitched, and that was my morning so far. While law enforcement were desperately trying to locate Nichols, the scene at Fulton County Courthouse was one of devastation. It still affects me up to this day. It's hard to talk about it. Judge Byrne was not only a judge, he was my friend. Julie was special. She was really kind. Julie made sure that the jury got how to cake every morning. 
she was really, really nice. Julie Brandau, she was warm and wonderful and friendly. It went with Judge Barnes. His chambers was a place of, if you had some time between cases and you wanted to hang out somewhere, you can go there and just sit there and eat popcorn, have a cup of coffee. He didn't have a lock on the store. All the other judges did. His was wide open. And Julie Brandau had that attitude also. She was just this, this really nice person. As Atlanta Police Department took over the crime scene, officers had no idea where Nichols was and offered a substantial reward for information. What he had done was to drive my car up one level, backed it into the parking space, taken my Navy blazer out of the car, put it on, walked across to the MARTA, the mass transit system, took the train to Lenox Square. With Nichols now the focus of one of the biggest manhunts America had ever seen, police were unaware he was just seven miles away in the streets around the Lenox Square shopping mall. 13 hours on from his first kill, he was about to take another innocent life. He was looking for a place to hide or whatever. And there was a house with the door open, and there was a federal agent in there working on his bathroom. The crime spree continued, with Nichols shooting and killing US Customs agent David Wilhelm at his home. He then steals his pickup truck, badge, and pistol. It was a pretty tense, tense time. I mean, we didn't know where he was or what he might do. What we did find out is that he committed another, another killing that night. We shot the federal marshal. Um, which is about a half a mile from my house. With the murder of off-duty federal agent David Wilhelm freshly in his wake, Nichols headed 30 miles north to Gwinnett County. I was asked to come down to downtown Atlanta. They wanted to film a, a request for him to turn himself in. And all of a sudden, a, a driver gets in the van and a reporter gets in the van and we take off. And he says, oh, he's in Gwinnett County. I'm just sitting in his van at this point in time. I'm like a prisoner. <laughs> at around 2 a.m., Ashley Smith was unpacking her new apartment when she headed out briefly to buy cigarettes. On her return, Nichols was waiting in the shadows. Placing a gun to her back, he forced his way into her apartment. He forces his way into a Gwinnett woman's apartment. A SWAT team surrounds Nichols. Having killed four innocent people in a murderous rampage, alleged rapist Brian Nichols was on the run. He had reached a town 30 miles north of downtown Atlanta. A lot of people high on psychopathy actually tend to be very impulsive and not engage in long-term thinking. And those four people were in his way, and so it was a means to an end. Nichols was aware the police were on his trail and had taken a hostage, single mom Ashley Smith. Ashley Smith had managed to stay alive by gaining the trust of Nichols, spending the night talking about God and forgiveness. They believe there is a hostage situation going on right now. This is in Duluth, Georgia. It's about 15 miles north of the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, where we know three people were killed yesterday. Ashley had made Nichols breakfast and encouraged the killer to turn himself in. He refused. At around 9.15 a.m., Ashley managed to persuade Nichols to let her go and see her daughter. As soon as she was in the car, she dialed 911. Police quickly surrounded the area. We were about maybe, I don't know, 150 feet from where he was, perhaps. And this apartment was surrounded, and I thought, if he doesn't come out, they're gonna, they're gonna kill him. But fortunately, he waved a, a white shirt, and then they swarmed him, and, and he was just covered. You couldn't even see him at that point in time. He did ask for me to come talk to him. I declined. 
My attitude was that I represented him on a rape case. I was not representing him on a murder case, especially given the fact that I knew the people who he had killed. Um, I knew Judge Barnes, I knew Julie Brandau, and there's no way I could do that. As the city of Atlanta emerged from a 26-hour lockdown, Brian Nichols was securely locked away, once again at Fulton County Jail. When a person commits a crime out on the streets, they get arrested, they go to the police department to get processed, and then they'll go to county jail. That's where they'll take away their belongings, dress them out in inmate attire, and fingerprint them, book them, and they wait there until they get scheduled to go to prison. Just under two months later, Nichols was indicted by a Fulton County grand jury on 54 counts. Citing mental health issues, Nichols pleaded not guilty. He may have planned these murders in order to get the death penalty. It seems more like his goal was just to escape the courthouse, just to escape prison, and not think much about the future. While awaiting trial at Fulton County Jail, Nichols attempted to enlist two sheriff's deputies while plotting an escape. It is safe to assume that every inmate wants to escape from prison. I would say some personality traits of somebody attempting to escape or wanting to escape would be maybe growing out their hair one day or cutting it to the next to be able to disguise themselves as they attempt to flee. Getting physically fit so that they are able to run or walk multiple miles. Learning the layout of the surrounding areas and towns, maybe acquiring a map, a compass, a cell phone to aid them in an escape. Those are the type of ones that are kind of smart with it. Deemed a high security risk, Nichols was moved to DeKalb County Jail. He remained here for two years. Until on July 10th, 2008, Nichols' murder trial began. He maintained his plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. Well, it was actually the first time I'd been a witness in a trial, especially when I was more involved with it. And it was, um, I was very nervous. They asked me to point him out in the courtroom. That's when I had a flashback because I, I knew I was going to have to tell the story again. And the, the image flashed through my mind about everything and yeah i know i wouldn't want to be in the same room with him again i actually broke down on the stand nichols was sitting with the attorneys next to him i kept looking at him i kept staring at him i could not help but stare at him I'm such an evil person it was hard because of uh, the loss of my my friends, Judge, Julie, deputies. Something I would never forget. I'll live with it for the rest of my life. In an incredible turn of events, it transpired that Nichols had killed the man about to give him his freedom. About six months after the shooting, I got a telephone call from an attorney who told me that the night before the shooting, that he had a conversation with Judge Barnes about the case. Judge Barnes told him he was gonna cut Brian Nichols free by granting a motion for a directed verdict of acquittal. If the defense thinks there's not enough evidence legally for, for a jury to even find somebody guilty beyond a reasonable doubt is a legal issue, it's insufficient. You can uh, make a motion for a directed verdict of acquittal. So Brian killed the person that was gonna cut him loose. The case would not even gone to the jury. Brian was gonna go home. The jury deliberated for 12 hours over two days before finding Nichols guilty of four counts of murder and 50 other charges. Sentenced to multiple life sentences with no chance of parole, 
Nichols was spared the death penalty when the jury failed to reach a unanimous decision. I think two or three people voted against it, but it all depends on who the jury is. If, if someone is, looks, <laughs> they say, looks like a killer, looks like a horrible person, they're more likely to do that. But he looked like an ordinary, middle-class guy. They blamed it on something mental, not the fact that he was a natural-born killer. Yes, I was pleased with the verdict because he's got a long time to think. He was given over 200 years. I think him being in prison is worse than the death penalty. It should be. Sentenced to four consecutive life sentences, Nichols was incarcerated in Georgia Diagnostic and Classification State Prison. With a history of escape attempts and plots, Nichols remains a high security risk to those guarding him. My understanding is they move him from place to place. They do not let the same guards guard him for a prolonged period of time because they don't want them to get too comfortable with him. Right? That they, you know, they move him around, different people interact with him because he's considered to be a high security risk, and I believe he is. I think if he felt cornered, I think he would he very possibly kill again. Brian Dickens is a person you cannot trust. He is a wolf in sheep clothing. Nichols' rap sheet, which features the deaths of so many law enforcement officials, has given him kudos with other prisoners. Reputation in prison is pretty much everything. So if a suspect committed a crime out on the streets, would it carry over the reputation inside a prison? That all depends on the notoriety. Did it make the news? Was the person that the crime was committed against, was it a police officer? So depending on who the victim was and the circumstances of the crime, absolutely that reputation can carry inside the prison. My guess is he's probably got a bit of notoriety there in the prison population. If you don't have much in prison, you try to garner what little you do have, he'll die there unless he, you know, escapes. One thing remains clear to all involved in this case. Brian Nichols is still one of the world's most evil prisoners. The, the, the impact of what he had done, he had taken a judge everyone liked. He took a court reporter, a beautiful person. He took a deputy life. A deputy that will be there for you anytime. He impacts so many people's lives, all the families of the victims. No one will never be the same.